Now it's time for a question period. The member from Renfrew, Mr. Thank you very much, Speaker. My uh, question is for the uh, Minister of Energy. Minister, winter is just around the corner, and all across Ontario, residents and small businesses are worried about their ability to pay their hydro bills. Sure. A senior living on a fixed the income, for Glengarry, heating their house electricity, which many of them are, doesn't know how they're going to meet the, the ob obligation. While air conditioning is not necessarily essential, heating most definitely is. For some, and I get this from people in my riding all the time, their energy bills, their electricity bills are higher than their old age pension. Peak rates now under your plans are 14 cents a kilowatt hour, and that doesn't include all of the added surcharge as a result of your energy policies. Minister, your policies have taken Ontario from one of the lowest cost electricity jurisdictions to one of the highest. Question. Are you going to continue to punish our residents and ratepayers, or, like winter, is a change in energy policy just around the corner as well? Speaker, the member will know that when our government took over in 2003, we had a deficit of electricity, we had a dirty system, and the system was unreliable. And over the course of the last nine years, Mr. Speaker, I'd ask for order, please. Thank you. And over the course of the last nine years, Mr. Speaker, we rebuilt the system with about $30 billion in transmission and generation costs. We've moved from a deficit of electricity to a surplus, from a dirty system to a clean system. That put pressure on prices, Mr. Speaker. Those pressure, price pressures were in our long-term energy plan in 2010-2013. They were there for everybody to see. We took very significant mitigation measures, Mr. Speaker, which those parties voted against. That includes the Ontario Clean Energy Benefit, the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit, Answer. saving qualifying individuals up to $963 per year. And in the supplementaries, Mr. Speaker, Thank I'll you. talk about the other issues. Thank you. Supplementary. Minister, you give with one hand, you take away with the other. That is cold comfort to those seniors who don't know how they're going to pay their bills this winter. Pun intended. Shame on you. You can do better than that. Look at an estimate this morning. It was clearly pointed out to you that hydro rates all in all in in the province of Manitoba are one-third what they are in Ontario. Wow. In British Columbia, wow. one-half. How can you explain to the people living on that fixed income how they can pay that much more in Ontario? It is because of your energy policies, your failed policies. You've decided to choose the most expensive options when replacing coal in the province of Ontario. That has also led to the loss of 300,000 manufacturing jobs and Oh yes, 300,000 manufacturing jobs here across the province of Ontario. Your policy are driving business away. Order. Order. The member from Bruce, here on Bruce, come to order, and the Minister of Finance come to order. And the member from Leeds, Grenville, come to order. And I'm keeping count. Minister, companies like Heinz, up, Caterpillar, Estrada, they have all cited energy prices as reasons for leaving the province of Ontario. When are you going to get the message? Thank you. Stop listening to your minions over there and get the message from the people of Ontario. Minister? Mr. Speaker, businesses will come and go in Ontario. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, there's more coming in than are leaving. Very significant. Mr. Speaker, we have the highest rate of investment capital of any jurisdiction in North America. I'm going to get attention one way or the other. The member from Chatham, Kent, Essex will come to order. Carry on. Mr. Speaker, the member knows well that we have implemented a very significant number of programs to assist businesses to come to Ontario with reduced uh, electricity costs and to stay here. The ICI, Industrial Conservation Initiative, Mr. Speaker, which has just been expanded uh, with probably upwards of 300 companies receiving 20 percent discount yes, on their electricity. There are other programs which I'll mention in my next supplementary. We have taken significant steps to mitigate prices because the price Thank pressures you. came from us investing because of the damage that they did for— Thank you. Final supplementary. 
Businesses come and go. That's quite an answer. Well, they're going at about a 10 to 1 ratio, Minister. That's not very good on your part. Minister, those companies that are coming here because you're giving them a one-off, they probably appreciate that, but they know that that is at the cost of everybody else in the province of Ontario. When Estrada, Caterpillar, Heinz, they cite energy reef costs as a reason for leaving. I have not heard of one single business ever say, we're coming to Ontario because of its energy policy. Not one. They may come here and in spite of their energy policy because you, they know they're giving, you're giving them a, a one-off handout. But that's, Speaker, Minister, last month, the ISO said that the global adjustment, that little understood little trick of yours, amounted to over $1 billion. Well, that is the cost, the difference between the value of electricity purchased and the amount you've paid to your contractors. The amount you've paid for electricity, Question. the difference between its value and what you paid is a $1 billion. That goes on everybody's hydro bill. That is driving people out of this province, and that is driving seniors into, po into poverty. When will you reverse the policy? Please. 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 Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, we have one of the best jobs, rec jobs creation records in this province. That's number one. Number two, Mr. Speaker, there are more businesses coming to here investing money than any other jurisdiction in North America, Mr. Speaker. Ontario's industrial rates compare favorably with other jurisdictions, despite what the PCs claim. Industrial rates in Northern Ontario are among the lowest in Canada and lower than 44 American states, Mr. Speaker. Industrial rates in Southern Ontario are lower than in Alberta, Michigan, New Jersey, and California, and in line with states in New York, Virginia, and Tennessee. Mr. Speaker, we have the programs to attract businesses and to create jobs in this province. They have no solutions in any shape whatsoever, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Infrastructure. Minister, you've not been clear whatsoever with the people of Ontario and the value of Mars and that debacle. CBRE appraised Phase 2, if it was 100% leased, at $303 million. We know that it's not fully leased, and a building filled with bureaucrats Mr. is not Finance. as much as one filled with research scientists. That's because the rental rates Minister for of Sport office space is $44 to $45 per square foot, and the off for research space, it's about $60 a foot. Minister, you've placed taxpayers at significant risk. Will you admit to this House, if phase two is filled with bureaucrats, the value of the building will be 25% less than the appraised value? Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Speaker, I'm, uh, I'm not really sure what the member is referring to when he says this government hasn't been clear when it comes to our way forward on this particular file. Speaker, we've released 700 pages of documents, Mr. Speaker, publicly so the member can have access to them. And in fact, we've offered to the committee the opportunity to see all of those, those documents with, with absolutely no redactions, Mr. Speaker. I think that's being pretty open. I think that's being transparent. I think that's being very clear. And we've also identified a path forward in seeking the best experts we can in our economy, Michael Nabrega and Carol Stevenson, as we move forward, Mr. Speaker. They've confirmed that the, the asset that we uh, we have uh, lent money to, to Mars Phase 2 for is worth more than the investment we've made, which means, Mr. Speaker, what the members just said is absolutely incorrect. I think, Mr. Speaker, what's unclear Answer. is the ability of the member to understand what a secured loan means. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the uh, expert panel uh, response again. Minister, mankind has often wondered if there's intelligent life on Mars. Well, you've proven that there's not a phase two, or even in your ministry. Minister, let's recap the problem you've created for taxpayers. The value of the building is the land cost plus the leasing revenue. When the leasing rate drops, so does the revenue. When the revenue drops, so does the value of the building. When you go from charging $60 a square foot to $45 a square foot, the value drops by 25%. Simple. Minister, will you admit that you will not be able to recover the $405 million of taxpayers' money you've already sunk into Mars Phase 2? Thank you. Minister. 
Mr. Speaker, the member may want to insult my intelligence. So look, I'm just a kid from Scarborough. I don't pretend I'm the smartest guy here. But I think if there was a vote taken in the House, Mr. Speaker, that compares the intelligence quotas of these two members that are exchanging right now, I'm not sure, but I think I might just edge them out in that respect. But, Mr. Speaker, let me, just, let me say this. I'm, I may not, but let me say this. What we're supporting here, Mr. Speaker, is, is a part of our economy that's extremely important. 50 per cent of our life sciences economy in Canada is located right here in Ontario. In that building, Mr. Speaker, in and around that building, about 10 per cent of the bioscience cluster is there. Mr. Speaker, this government stands by our bioscience cluster. This government's going to continue to make investments that are going to grow innovation in this province. The party opposite may want to, Mr. Speaker, not support those kind of approaches. That's up to them. We're Sir? building the next generation economy. We're creating jobs, and we're going to continue to make those important investments. Thank you. Final supplementary. There is no cluster there uh, except the cluster of bureaucrats, Minister. Let's recap the story here. There never was a business case. The private sector won't rent there. The banks and the investors won't touch Mars 2. It's like an empty Taj Mahal but full of bureaucrats, not tourists. ARE got a $65 million bail bailout. The taxpayer loaned $224 million. Then the taxpayer is on the hook for another $106 million in interest costs. And Mars gets a free building that the taxpayer fills up and pays rent on. Minister, your responses have been lubricious at least to this House. And this expert panel, I can't imagine that it was hired for anything other than to camouflage the slippery language that's been going on here. Will their report be transparent about Answer. the obvious facts? Or will that expert panel simply shield you from further accountability to this House? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the member's information is simply incorrect, as usual. And I think what I want to do, Mr. Speaker, in responding is to suggest that what is his alternative? What's his party's alternative? Because from what he's saying, that party would have just, just let Mars Phase 2 rot in the ground. Mr. Speaker, that would have been irresponsible. So what we've done, Mr. Speaker, is we've made some important investments to ensure that this project could continue. We've taken the best advice from Michael Nabrega and Carol Stevenson to make sure we're moving forward in a way that's responsible to taxpayers, in a way that's responsible to our commitment, Mr. Speaker, to create jobs in this province. We're looking to further advice, Mr. Speaker, from those individuals, which we should receive very soon. And then we're looking to move forward, Mr. Speaker, on a project that had challenges, yes, but, Mr. Speaker, challenges that we're going to fix to ensure that this project has a positive future. Thank you. That, Mr. Speaker, is leadership. Thank you. New question. The Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Yesterday, we learned that the Liberals are on track to fire 10,000 people. Does the Premier really think that now is the time to put out 10,000 pink slips, Speaker? Thank you. Premier? Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, I'm not sure where uh, the leader of the third party would have gotten that information because that's not the case, Mr. Speaker. Uh, maybe she's confusing it with the platform of the uh, Conservatives, but it was they were going to fire 100,000 people, Mr. Speaker. Um, what we're doing, Mr. Speaker, is we're engaging in negotiations. We believe in the collective bargaining process, and uh, we're going to make sure that we have a good ongoing relationship with our. Uh, our public sector partners and mr speaker we are going to continue to constrain constrain salaries and, and benefits mr speaker because we know that that is important if we are to remain on our path to balance by 2017-18 yeah. supplementary well, Speaker, this is what the head of the Ontario Public Service Union had to say about the Liberal plan for public service. Quote, it is worse than anything Mike Harris tabled. That's a quote, Speaker. Now, the first step of this plan could mean 10,000 people get fired. Is the Premier going to? Is, is the Premier really ready to hand out 10,000 pink slips and fire 10,000 Ontarians? Mr. Speaker, you know what is going on right now is that negotiations are beginning with OPSU. And everything I know about negotiation, Mr. Speaker, is that it is much better for the discussion to be at the table, yeah. to bargain in the public, and to start to make overblown statements about 
about what is or isn't happening is not helpful, Mr. Speaker. When I was in Thunder Bay on the weekend, I had the opportunity to talk to some folks who Member were expressing their opinion at the, uh, uh, on the, uh, the driveway when I was, uh, I was leaving the venue, Mr. Speaker. I had the opportunity to speak with some folks who are part of the, uh, the union, and I made it clear to them that it is our commitment to have a fair negotiating process at the, at the bargaining table. Mr. Answer. Speaker, because we want uh, a collective bargaining process that allows for uh, a very good di dialogue between the employer and the employee. Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, you may recall that Don Drummond uh, said that uh, the Liberal budget would mean the firing of 100,000 people. The Liberals are already privatizing information technology, Speaker. We know that that's the case. People will be fired through that process. And with the holidays around the corner, we now find out that the Liberals are getting ready to hand out 10,000 pink slips to Ontarians. Will the Premier tell Ontarians who exactly she's planning on firing? Well, Mr. Speaker, you know, I am not going to engage in the fantasy that the uh, the leader of the third party. I'm not going to. I'm not going to lend credibility to the numbers that the leader of the third party is throwing around because that is simply not the case. We are engaging in a collective bargaining process that will be fair, Mr. Speaker. That will be uh, will have integrity at the bargaining table. We are not going to bargain in the media, Mr. Speaker. It is not helpful, and it is certainly not helpful at the very beginning of the process. This is the beginning beginning of the process. We want, we want there to be an open dialogue between the employer and the employee so that there can be a good, solid, negotiated uh, agreement, Mr. Speaker. From Simcoe, and South, the Simcoe, leader of the North, third party, I would order. say, with respect, Mr. Speaker, is not advancing that Answer. process by her line of questioning. New question, the leader of the opposition. My next question is also for the Premier. People suffer when services are cut, but the Premier's Minister of Health doesn't believe that cuts are real. He told a reporter he doesn't believe that patient care has suffered in Ontario. <laughs> Health Quality Ontario, on the other hand, Speaker, says that one in seven hospital beds are occupied by people who would be better off in their homes or in long-term care. As a result, last week in Sudbury, ER wait times shot up and seven surgeries were cancelled. Now. Will the Premier, on behalf of the Health Minister, Deputy apologize House to Leader. people whose surgeries were cancelled and set the record straight about the health care cuts in Ontario? Well, Mr. Here. Speaker, I, uh, I know that the Minister of Health and Long-Term Care is going to want to speak to the, uh, the details of our plan, but let me just say that the Leader of the Third Party has identified exactly why it is important for us to continue with the plan that we have in place, because our plan is transforming the health care system and is providing care for people at home where they need it when they need it are we in the middle of a transition mr speaker is it is it is it clear that there is more that we have to do Absolutely. But we're changing the model because, as the leader of the third party herself has said, people want care at home and will be better off if they get care at home in their communities. So that's what we're doing. We're investing in those services. And, Mr. Speaker, Answer. it is clear that we have to make more investments and it is clear that we have to work with the sector to make sure that Thank people you. are getting timely care. That's, in, that's what we're in the process of doing. Thank you. Well, Speaker, patient care is suffering in this process. Province, but this Liberal government refuses to admit that they're cutting the services that people rely on. Here's a news bulletin for the Premier. In Windsor, Essex and Sarnia, daily nursing visits have been cut by 33 per cent. Those are services that people rely on, health care services that are being cut by this government. PSW services are being rolled back to 2013 levels. But yesterday, the minister claimed that these cuts to home care were simply not true. He called them myths and said, there were no cuts at all. Speaker, this is outrageous for the minister to deny cuts that patients are actually experiencing. Cuts that have spelled out have been spelled out in black and white in CCAC's own board minutes. How can the premier and her minister have the audacity to deny that these cuts to patient care are happening Question. under this Liberal government? Thank you. Mr. Speaker. 
you know, I, I just want to, I want to make it clear that we understand on this side of the House that the transition that we're going through does mean that there are changes to service that people may be experiencing. We're fully cognizant of that, and we understand that that is part of the transition process. But, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the third party would have people believe that somehow we don't have to go through this transition, that somehow the aging population and, quite frankly, the demands that people make on the health care system, and some of those demands are they want to stay at home. People don't want to move into uh, a long-term care home or into other the kinds member of living Hamilton situations Mountain until they are ready, order. Mr. Speaker. So, for the leader of the third party to suggest that somehow we can just go through this transition, that there'll be no change in service and that there will be no adjustment that has to be made is just to lead people astray, Mr. Speaker. It's not the case. We are investing. We invested more last year than we did the year before. We will continue to invest in that transformation, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, the Premier can't have it both ways. She can't answer part one of my question and say we're putting the money into home care and PSWs, and then the second question, uh, pretend that I didn't just say that there are major cuts to both PSWs and home care services. I don't understand what this Premier is trying to say. Changes equal cuts, as far as the Liberals are concerned, it looks like. Cuts to health care are real. They're happening under this government's watch, and they're happening on purpose. Cancelled surgeries in Sudbury, cutting nursing by a third in Windsor, chronic gridlock in the Thunder Bay Hospital. More than half of sick people can't get to in to see their doctor speaker. Seniors waiting 111 days for long-term care. And half the patients, half of the patients in this province that suffer health, uh, health, heart failure are not able to have their their necessary one-week follow-up. Does Question. the Premier agree, agree with her Minister of Health that health care cuts are not real and don't affect people? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, rather than listening to the leader of the third party with regards to her declarations about the state of health care, I would rather actually refer to Health Quality Ontario's report that just came out last week that actually said it's important to point out that their report states is that Ontario's health care system is performing better than it was five or ten years ago. These are great indicators that our plan is working, Mr. Speaker, and it's just not true. We've increased, in fact, this year alone, nearly a quarter of a billion dollars invested in home and community care. We increased the Erie St. Clair uh, CCAC's budget by $3 million this year compared to last year. In fact, the funding to the Erie St. Clair Lynn has doubled, Mr. Speaker, since we came into power ten years yeah. ago. So the allegations that the member of the, the, of the third party is making are absolutely false. I think it's important she recognize that the situation in, in Ontario is improving. Health care is of the highest quality it can be. Thank you. Any question? The member from Dufferin Calvary. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ben Levin from your transition team has been charged with seven counts involving child pornography, some happening while he was working for you in early 2013. When you learned of these charges, what internal investigation was done to ensure no government property was used and or compromised by Mr. Levin? Well, Mr. Speaker, um, I believe that this is a case that is before the courts, and I really, uh, I really cannot comment on uh, any of the details because, as I say, it is, uh, it's a, a current uh, and active legal file. Yep. Supplementary. Premier, I didn't ask about the police investigation. I asked about your investigation. What did you order an internal investigation when you learned of these seven charges? What assurances can you give us that the government resources were not used to distribute or access to child pornographer while Ben Levin was on your transition team? Mr. Speaker, this is a case that is before the courts. I cannot comment on any of the aspects of the case. Thank you. Your question, the member from Windsor to Clemson. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning is for the Premier. Good morning, Premier. In 2012, Mars got a special innovation grant from the City of Toronto worth $23 million over 10 years. But one of the conditions of that grant was that 98% of the property had to be used for biomedical research. We now know the secret cabinet plan that authorized the first Mars bailout said that more than half the building would be used to staff the Ontario Public Service. 
So the question for the Premier is whether the Liberal government plans to break the deal with the City of Toronto and waste another $23 million on Mars. Premier. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Well, well thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, you know, I think the member knows that we have uh, a couple of esteemed individuals, Michael Nabrega and Carol Stevenson, taking a look at, uh, at, to, uh, at the opportunities forward in terms of the best way to protect the taxpayer investment and the best way to ensure that the innovation agenda and vision of Mars can be continued. So we're looking forward to getting those, those uh, recommendations, and I don't want to in any way step all over those recommendations before they come forward. But I've been very clear, and I think the member uh, would, would be able to read through the uh, uh, my comments here, that there, there has been no momentum whatsoever uh, uh, with regard to the idea of putting bureaucrats into Mars Phase 2. Uh, I've been very clear about that. Uh, there's no momentum behind that idea, but I don't want to prejudge what Michael Nabrega and Carol Stevenson uh, bring forward. I want to make sure that, and I've told them, I want their recommendations Answer. to be completely unfettered as I expect them to be. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, the agreement with the City of Toronto is clear. 98 per cent of the building must be used for biomedical and scientific research. If the conditions aren't met, the city can take back the $23 million. Now, the Liberal government seems unclear on what they're going to do. To keep the grant, they need high-tech tenants, but they can't find high-tech tenants, so they might use Mars for office space, but then they would lose the $23 million. So which will it be? Will the Premier keep the building two-thirds empty, or will she lose $23 million? Mr. Speaker, I, I welcome the member's question, and, and I, I think I can read through his question that the NDP are in support of continuing to ensure that Mars's vision continues and that Phase 2, in fact, uh, as it moves forward, take that into consideration. Mr. Speaker, I think that's valid advice, and I, I expect, uh, Mr. Speaker, that may well be the advice we receive from Michael Nabrega and Carol Stevenson. I'm looking forward to that advice. Certainly, Mr. Speaker, this government remains committed to Mars's vision. Certainly, we remain committed to ensuring the 51,000 jobs in the bioscience sector can remain to be supported. Uh, this is an important Important part. Mars is an important yes, part of our innovation agenda. So I take the member's question as support uh, for, and a recommendation for us to continue to invest in Mars's vision going forward, and uh, be happy to receive uh, the advice that we get from uh, Michael Nabrega and Carol Stevenson going forward. Thank you. Question: The member from Brampton uh, Springdale. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Attorney General. Attorney General, certain members of my constituency have expressed an interest in a piece of legislation, the Electronic Commerce Act, that relates to electronic signatures and real estate transactions. As most of us know, the purchase of a home is one of the most complex and time-consuming transactions a person can make. Myself, as, so, as well as some of my constituents, would like to know more details regarding this act. Could the Attorney General please inform this House how the Electronic Commerce Act is making the sale and purchase of a real estate easier and more efficient for the people of Ontario? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Let me uh, say thank you to the member from Brampton Springdale. She is right, you know. I, the purchase of a home is a big moment in anybody's life, and the idea behind the Electronic, Electronic Commerce Act is to make this process more efficient. So, Ontario's 2013 amendments to the Electronic Commerce Act will allow people to electronically sign paperwork and email it to their real estate agent. Good idea. The proposed regulation would support the reliability of electronic signature on agreements of purchase and sale of land by stipulating that e-signature must be reliable for the purpose of identifying the person who signs, permanent, accessible by people who are entitled to view it. These amendments are intended to reduce the time needed to complete a deal. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Speaker, I thank the Attorney General for the answer. This is great news for my constituents as the purchase of a home can be a stressful experience. Any opportunity to make the process more efficient and easier for individuals or families should be looked at. Since this is arguably the biggest purchase of an individual or family's life, I feel as though the protection of our consumers should be paramount. My only concern regarding this legislation is that of fraud. Speaker, through you to the Attorney General, could this House be informed on how the Electronic Commerce Act protects consumers from fraud, specifically regarding the use of electronic signatures? Thank you. Attorney General. 
Yes, thank you again for this uh, important question. The issue of fraud is part of the reason we are currently uh, in consultation period until December 31st. Lawyers and real estate agents are already required to verify the identity of their clients. These rules apply to electronic transactions as well as paper-based transactions and remain in effect. Whatever it is approved for use must be safe, secure, and easy to use for consumers and small businesses. The real estate industry in Ontario has been requesting this change for some time, and we are pleased to be moving forward with it. So the deadline for comments is uh, until December 31st, 2014. And if people want to comment, we welcome their comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Question, the member from Kitchener, Conestoga. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, my question is uh, to the Minister of uh, Transportation. Speaker, yesterday we learned of the Minister of Transportation's $61 million Pan Parapan Transportation Plan. It featured lots and lots of encouragement for plan. commuters to examine their commuting options, <laughs> encouraging them to work flexible hours and stockpile supplies. Wow. Speaker, after spending $61 million of taxpayers' money, the minister is asking them to stock up, stay home, and off the roads. Is this the best advice you could come up with? Wow. Mr. Transportation. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member uh, for, uh, for asking that question. It's unfortunate, I would think, Speaker, that he didn't pay attention to all of the elements of the very ambitious and robust plan that we have to deal with transportation uh, issues that uh, will be occurring during the Pan Am, uh, Para Pan Am game. Speaker, as I talked about, as ministry officials talked about yesterday when speaking about this, uh, we have a variety of options in front of us that we're presenting to the people of the region to make sure that not only the games are the extraordinary success that they will be, Speaker, uh, but that we also keep our region moving. The transit-first approach, the additional temporary HLV lanes that will be made available, not just to people associated with the games themselves, but to the public at large. Uh, the fact that we are this many months in advance of the games providing a clear communications materials and letting people know what the challenges will be, Speaker, Answer. bodes well. Uh, and I look forward to responding to additional, with additional details from the supplementary. Thanks, Speaker. Thank supplementary. Speaker, the Wynn Liberals have had years to get this right, and yet we're left with a mixed bag of ingredients that add up to a recipe of traffic chaos. Not everybody can carpool or bicycle in, and Limo flexible boat. hours simply don't exist in some occupations. Surely the minister knows that taking out 235 kilometres of current lanes from commuters for HOVs adds up to major traffic gridlock. Rush hours on reduced lanes will mean significant delays. That's obvious. Speaker, the minister has the studies. Will he tell us today how long, on average, rush hour commuters will see their daily drive to work delayed during the games? How long? Thanks very much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for the supplementary question. I think it's, uh, it is important to recognize, as I said in the uh, response to the initial question, it is a very strong plan to make sure that the region continues to move throughout the games themselves. I, uh, I got pushed. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Tembrook is warned. Carry on, please. Speaker, thanks. As I was saying, uh, the very strong plan that the Ministry of Transportation have developed to make sure that we can keep our region moving during the Pan Am, Para Pan Am Games, and also make sure that the games themselves are a success. It is important to stress, as I did yesterday during the briefing, that we have relied on uh, mo working with, most, uh, with uh, more than 30 partners on developing this plan, that we have actually taken Answer. the best experiences from what's taken place around the world in jurisdictions that have hosted game speaker. And I'm a little bit surprised this particular critic would ask this question, seeing as how he didn't even show up to yesterday's technical oh, briefing. Okay. No question. Member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Energy. Minister, as you know, radioactive heavy, heavy water leaked from a reactor at the Pickering Nuclear Station this past Friday. My understanding is that five to ten tons of radioactive heavy water uh, leaked over a roughly two-hour period. My understanding is the public was not notified of this leak until Monday of this week. Why was the public not notified within 24 hours that the leak occurred? Minister of Energy. 
thank the member for the question, and uh, we did have some discussions on this this morning at the Estimates Committee, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, and we did uh, uh, bring, of, of our own volition, uh, Paul uh, Tasquet, who is the Chief Nuclear Officer uh, from OPG, to the committee, and he was available to answer questions, and he answered them extremely well, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, he confirmed that we followed all of the protocol, uh, and uh, the Canadian Nuclear uh, Commission uh, was notified. Nu Safety Commission was notified. Uh, they have confirmed that all protective uh, protocols uh, were followed uh, to ensure the public safety uh, of the public, uh, the employees. And, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, I have to say that uh, uh, they also, of their own volition, uh, without a requirement to do so, uh, sent notices to all the mayors, to all the uh, uh, public safety uh, organizations uh, that would have anything involved in the issue, Mr. Speaker. It was comprehensive, and they followed all the principles. Supplementary. Speaker, it seems like everyone was informed except the public. Uh, Minister, I think you'd agree that a leak of 5 to 10 tonnes of radioactive water is no small thing, and quite frankly, I'm surprised that OPG would wait three days to notify the residents of neighbouring communities that a leak of this magnitude had occurred near nearby. Will this government change its protocol for notifying neighbouring communities so that residents don't have to wait three days to learn of a serious leak? Minister Lincoln. Mr. Speaker, I'll just confirm that OPG followed all of the protocols. The Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission's Protocol RD 99.3 states that OPG will communicate in one business day of unplanned events exceeding regulatory limits or off-site effects. Mr. Speaker, they did. They went beyond what they were required to do, notifying almost immediately all the public safety officials of all the municipalities in the area. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I think the member thinks he's got some little technical twist to try to embarrass OPG, Mr. Speaker. They were outstanding in how they responded. There was no da danger to individuals, the public, in any way, shape, or form. It was totally 100% contained, and the, nuclear, the Canadian Nuclear Safety uh, Commission has confirmed that after the fact, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. New question, the member from Kitchener Centre. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Now, yesterday we saw some of our colleagues on the other side of the House head for Sudbury to debate their ideas for the North, and it's good to see them visiting that part of our province. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Premier has made it very clear that our government is committed to building Ontario up, and this means not only investing in urban areas, but also our smaller and our northern communities as well. Minister, there are more than 11,000 kilometres of provincial highways in northern Ontario. That's about 60 per cent of the entire provincial highway network. Well, sir. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell this House how our government has invested in transportation infrastructure in northern Ontario? Thank you. Minister Thank you. Kitchener Centre for question. Yeah, it was terrific to see the uh, opposition actually uh, going about the from Timmins, James Bay will come to order. A, a part of the province they ignored during the. The member from Timmins, James Bay, will come to order, and the member from uh, Eglinton, Lawrence. Thank you. Finish, please. I, and Mr. Speaker, in fact, I would certainly encourage the uh, members of the opposition to visit other parts of the north, uh, places like Kenora, Red Lake, uh, Hearst, uh, Geraldton, Longlack, Thunder Bay, because this would give them a real opportunity to see firsthand the investments our government has yep. made in roads, highways, and bridges uh, across northern Ontario. Since 2003, Mr. Speaker, our government has approved over 4,000 kilometers of highway, not bad, 245 bridges. We've constructed hundreds of kilometers of new four-lane highway along a bunch of new bridges. We've invested more than $5 billion, $5 billion in Northern Highways since 2003, an unprecedented. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for his response. It's very encouraging to know that we do have a very balanced and comprehensive plan for Ontario and for improving our transportation network. Uh, this will, of course, add to strengthening our economy. It's going to create jobs, and it improves our quality of life for all Ontarians. Mr. Speaker, we know that this year our government is going to be investing $2.2 billion dollars to repair and expand our provincial highways and our bridges. For Northern Ontario, this includes 527 
$1.7 million. Mr. Speaker, can the minister please share with us the recent investments that we have made to build and fix transportation in Northern Ontario? Thank you. Minister. Well, thank you again to the member for Kitchener Centre, because certainly investment in transportation infrastructure is one of our government's top priorities and certainly one of the top priorities for Northern Ontario. Let me just tell you a bit about the past construction season in uh, 2013 in, in Northern Ontario. We upgraded 499 kilometres of highways and 33 bridges. We constructed 58 kilometres of new highway, uh, including two new bridges, and that, of course, included the construction of uh, 13 kilometres of new four lanes highway of Highway 17 between Thunder Bay and Nipigon, on a great project, and we are continuing work on the expansion of uh, Highway 69 south of Sudbury, including new interchanges and bridges. Another remarkably successful year for the Northern Highways program, and I think a real commitment, Speaker, that by continuing to invest in the expansion and the improvement of vital yes, transportation, we're helping to support a dynamic business climate in the North and improve the lives of all Northerners. Thank you. you. Yeah, yeah. Question, the member from Prince Edward Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport this morning. Minister, are you aware that your ministry has signed off on a report that states that locating wind turbines in Prince Edward County, specifically in South Marysburg in Prince Edward County, would cause negative effects on several local heritage sites? <laughs> Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, uh, the member's question. I'm, uh, I'm not aware of this specific issue. I would love to uh, sit down with the uh, member and get some more information and provide him with the Member from Huron, Bruce, come to order. Thank you. Supplementary. Thanks very much, Speaker. This is part of the problem with this government. They're acting in silos. They don't know what one ministry is doing from one to the other. Minister, the provincial policy statement from 2014 for your ministry states, and I quote, significant built heritage resources and significant cultural heritage landscapes shall be preserved. And according to your own ministry, that includes the steeple at Mount Tabor Playhouse in Milford in Prince Edward County in South Marysburg. However, the project that would denigrate these sites was posted onto the EBR, the Environmental Bill of Rights. Minister, what should I tell my constituents in Prince Edward County? That you'll ignore your own policies, you'll trample on the Ontario Heritage Act, yeah. and you'll bend over backwards to help a wind developer yeah. before you'll help the people of Prince Edward County? Good question. Thank you, Minister. Th thank you, Mr. Speaker. What I think you can tell your, uh, your constituents back home is that you'll book an appointment, sit down with me, have an exchange and a conversation so you can update us on what's going on and work with us in order to find a solution. I would expect that if there's an issue, if there's an issue that's taking place, I think as MPPs in this legislature, we need to work together to get to the bottom and find solutions. And you know my office is accessible, so anytime you want to address these issues, please come and see me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning to you. My question is to the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. International mining giant Cliffs Natural Resources has spent $550 million in the Ring of Fire, had a plan to create thousands of jobs, can no longer do business with the Ontario Liberals. Uh -oh. The CEO of Cliffs Natural Resources made headlines last month saying that he had zero hope for the Ring of Fire and that the project was beyond the point of no return. Uh -oh. Last week, he went on to say, every investment made here was a disaster. Mm. Does the minister concur with Cliff CEO's assessment that the 60 billion Ring of Fire project is dead? Minister of Northern well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, thank you very much. And I, I'd like to think that the uh, member opposite would, would agree with me when I say that that could not be more wrong. We are moving forward very, very diligently and actively in terms of the Ring of Fire and are working forward on a plan that we are indeed actually implementing. May I say this about Cliff Natural Resources? Yes, indeed, they are were one of the major companies involved in the Ring of Fire. They obviously have got some challenges of their own. We saw a decision that they made last week related to 
another one of their operations in another province. The fact is, there is significant continued industry interest in the Ring of Fire, let alone the fact that we are working so closely with the First Nations, Matawa First Nations, and other First Nations organizations to move this project forward. We recognize, and I think everyone yes, in the sir. House does, how important it is that we make sure that there is a insured benefits to all the First Nations communities as part of that project. In my supplementary, I'll look forward to expanding the plan that we have. Supplement. Minister, in the seven years your government had to develop the Ring of Fire, it has failed to come up with a plan that will create jobs, build infrastructure, and reduce the high price of electricity. Your government's promise a, develop, a, a development board that was supposed to include partners in industry and First Nations. But besides four bureaucrats sitting at, the, at a table playing euchre by themselves, uh -huh. we see nothing. Your government's regional framework agreement with First Nations isn't working. When Mattawa chiefs say the government is excluding them from the Development Corporation Board and is not consulting them on mining permits in the Ring of Fire. Minister, will it be another seven years or more of us asking questions? Minister. Mr. Speaker, it certainly needs to be noted off the top of my response that indeed the, the party opposite uh, uh, put nothing in their platform in terms of supporting the Ring of Fire. We have a $1 billion commitment in terms of transportation infrastructure. And in relationship to the other part of our. Stop the clock, please. The member from the, the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing knows better than to put up uh, something that is not supposed to be put up, and I would thank the Deputy House Leader for providing the material. So while we have made an absolute firm commitment of $1 billion for our transportation infrastructure, there's been no support on the other side of the House. And may I say, it would certainly be gratifying to get support from all sides of the House related to the federal government matching those dollars, and we know how important that is in terms of investor confidence. As for the Ring of Fire Infrastructure Development Corporation, that is focused very specifically on bringing yes, all those partners on board. That's what we're doing, that's what we're actively doing, and indeed, as I said before, the work that we are doing with the first thing is vital. We seek your support. This is a thank you. Stop the clock, please. Uh, I do want to remind this particular minister that when I stand, you sit. Uh, with with no editorial. The uh, new question: the member from Etobicoke North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Ministry of Labour deserve to receive the compensation that they are due, the paycheck that they've earned through their own hard work. Unfortunately, Speaker, we continue to see certain unfair practices, incidents which occur in workplaces across Ontario where people aren't being treated fairly by employers. Whether it's not receiving vacation pay, scheduled breaks, parental leave, a minimum wage or other issues, Workers in this province are concerned that they aren't getting everything they're entitled to. Speaker, my question is this. What is the Ministry, Ministry of Labour doing to ensure that basic employment standards are upheld and workers in Ontario are getting what they've earned? Next. Thank you. Minister of Labour. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Etobicoke North for that very important question. Speaker, the Employment Standards Act sets out the uh, minimum requirements that uh, deal with the payment of wages. That includes overtime pay, vacation pay, public holiday pay, minimum wage. It also includes pregnancy and parental and personal emergency leave, and it also talks about termination and severance. We proactively inspect workplaces in various province-wide employment standard blitzes. We're all committed to enforcing the ESA at the Ministry of Labour. We continue to do all we can because we want to know at the end of a hard day's work that every Ontarian is receiving the paycheck they deserve. We've got three scheduled province-wide proactive blitzes uh, that are focusing on uh, workers who are all too often exploited by their employers, uh, sadly, Speaker. They are interns vulnerable and temporary foreign workers Answer. and temporary health agencies. What these blitzes do, Speaker, is help educate employees about the rights that they and every other Ontarian has under the Employment Standards Act. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Uh, I and my constituents appreciate your stewardship of these important files, but I do flag for you a particular concern, something that I hear about in Etobicoke North and I'm sure others of uh, my colleagues do as well. 
Many employees fear that their supervisor will react negatively if they question them on their rights, entitlements and privileges under the Act. In many companies, staff turnover is high and workers feel lucky to have a position at all, and they fear that standing up might cost them their job. In other cases, many employees just don't know their rights under the ESA at all, and they just don't report various infractions because they're unaware of their own rights and privileges. And spe uh, speaker, as the minister said, there are proactive inspections of various workplaces, but how does the ministry attempt to ensure that all employees know their rights under the Employment Excellent Standards Act? Question. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the, uh, the member from Etobicoke North for that fine supplementary, because it does get to the heart of the matter. In addition to our proactive enforcement blitzes, the ministry has got several outreach and education um, initiatives. We're on social media, and the idea is to increase employees' awareness of employment standards and the right they have. And I want to be very, very clear on this, Speaker. And all members can help me when they're talking to people around the province of Ontario. Employees in Ontario need to know it's against the law for employers to take reprisal actions against employees who are simply exercising their rights under the Employment Standards Act. Earlier this year, the ministry ran a Know Your Rights campaign. Uh, it, it ran in 90 ethnic newspapers, 27 languages, and it ran on television speaker in 22 languages as well. Talked about employment standards, labour relations, yes, health and safety on the job. Speaker, anybody who's got a question on the, the rights can call the Ministry's Information Centre. It's 1 800 531 551. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. No question. The member from Bruce Bray Owen Sound. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Community and Social Services. Time and again, your government announces that the children and adults with special needs are a priority, even though story after story I hear from parents and people with special needs suggest otherwise. In fact, the cuts facing the agencies and the people they serve are appalling. 62% of service agencies have cut hours of staff. 51% cut staff positions. 58% are unable to fill open positions, for example, maternity leave. 7% have shut down programs, and 47% are realizing increasing numbers of clients served in programs, some who need 24-hour care. Minister, my question today is how much of the $810 million you recently announced is going to the front line? Good question. Thank you. Good question. Good question. Social Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and I'm delighted to have this opportunity to speak again about our tremendous investment in developmental service workers uh, that we are totally committed to. <clears throat> we know that the type of work that the front line does is invaluable. I have been uh, uh, across this province now, meeting many of these frontline workers. Uh, their work is uh, extremely valuable, uh, and our government has shown this particular commitment to the valuable services that they provide through uh, our budget, which, as I remember, I think we all remember, the uh, official opposition voted against. And so, uh, it is quite clear that uh, our investment will be going to those frontline workers. We have dedicated a large uh, sum for that very purpose, uh, and uh, negotiations Answer. are currently underway in terms of its distribution. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, supplementary. Back to the Minister of Community and Social Service. Well, Minister, last week I met with a number of people from the front lines as well, and I can tell you without reservation whatsoever that those agencies supporting our most vulnerable citizens do not believe this money is going to the front line. They don't want to cut staff, programs, or hours. You are forcing that decision, sadly. It seems quite harsh that after 11 years, your party has allowed 23,000 people to languish on wait lists. Shit. That means in very Shit. real and practical terms, our most vulnerable citizens are not having their needs met under your watch. Order. Again, we want and need your assurance that these cuts will be reversed. So how much of that eight how much, Minister, how much of that eight hundred and ten million is actually going to the frontline services? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Yes, Speaker, as was extremely clear in our budget, our government is investing $200 million over three years for frontline workers in the lower wage bands. And currently, we are working with employers and unions, and we're discussing an approach that will ensure a service system for the future. And we want, obviously, to promote labor stability as well as ensuring a qualified workforce. Uh, we're working with the Ministry of Labor. There are a number of tables established, as I understand it. And we will continue to work to ensure that those frontline, extremely valuable workers will get the type of increase in salary that we committed to and that which they deserve. Thank you. Your question, the member from London West. 
Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Labour. Speaker, the Ministry is apparently deeply disappointed about community legal clinics advertising for unpaid articling positions due to lack of funding. Speaker, articling students have already graduated. They must article for a year to become fully licensed lawyers. Many have families to support and are carrying huge debt loads. Students who want to gain experience representing disadvantaged and marginalized legal aid cl clients will not be able to afford to work for free. What is the minister's plan to ensure that articling students are not forced to take unpaid work in order to practice law? Mr. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to uh, the. Uh, the, uh, the Honourable Member for that very important question. Uh, it doesn't matter what your job title or, or your position is, if you perform work for somebody in the province of Ontario, you're covered by the Employment Standards Act and you deserve to be paid. There's a very narrow exemption that exists, Speaker, for co-op students, trainees and the self-employed. The, the exemption is also for accredited university and college programs to give their students valuable workplace experience while they pursue their degree. Now, these rules have been on the books for, uh, for many years, and we we've been very active in terms of increasing people's awareness. The, uh, the member spoke about my, uh, my disappointment when I heard this new speaker, and I share that disappointment with her as well. Um, it is legal currently for a student at law Answer. to work, but it's deeply, deeply disappointing when any law office or legal aid clinic or otherwise chooses not to pay a student who accepts an articling position, especially when Thank it's you. a 10 month full time job speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Speaker, access to justice is fundamental to a functioning democracy. It's critical that the justice system includes lawyers who represent the diversity of our province, which is why articling positions have always been paid. The rise in unpaid articling positions creates barriers to people from low income and often racialized backgrounds to becoming lawyers. What will the minister do about the current Employment Standards Act ex exemptions that exclude law students and some other professionals from the minimum wage provisions of the Act? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you once again to uh, the member for that excellent supplementary. It's an issue I think we all need to turn our attention to. I can tell you what we do, Speaker, at the province of Ontario. All articling students that work in the legal services branch of every government of Ontario ministry are paid as they should be, Speaker. So certainly we're setting the example. Minimum wage, uh, wage laws are very important to employment standards protections. They ensure that individuals are not exploited and they're paid for the work they, in, they indeed do. Here at the province of Ontario, at the ministries, as I said, Speaker, we pay each and every one of the articling students the, uh, the money they're entitled to. In this case, what we have, Speaker, before us, and what I'm turning my attention to, is there currently is a regulatory exemption that predates our government. The ministry will be reaching out to colleagues in the field, in the legal field, through the other ministries. Answer to uh, ensure that we begin a discussion on this regulatory exemption as it exists today, Speaker. Thank you. Question? Member from Kingston in the Islands. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Merci, Monsieur President. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Mr. Speaker, a number of my constituents are becoming more and more concerned about nuisance animal interactions, which seems to increase as the months get colder. In fact, I have seen coyotes, and while they are a magnificent and beautiful animal, they're not exactly what we feel comfortable seeing in our cities and suburbs. We have heard about stories like Anita Greenaway from Barrie, whose dog was attacked by a coyote in October in the Arda Road area. And with recent stories about pet owners seeing more coyotes in Mississauga, Burlington, Brampton, and perhaps less so now in Kings than Kingston and the Islands, constituents wonder what they can do to ensure that they and their pets stay safe.
No doubt there are implications with respect to our changing climate, which is why these animals are Question. being brought closer to our communities. Um, the Minister of Natural Resources, can you please tell us how uh, constituents can help resolve this problem, what they can do to ensure the life Thank you. that they have a negative interaction Thank with you. priority? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, thank you, uh, thank you very much, and I want to thank the member from uh, Kingston and the Islands for for the question. We, uh, in our ministry, have seen this issue coming. I would say I think that anyone with an interest in this would have been following the media reports that have been coming forward on a very regular basis over the last several months, and I would say you could go back even longer. Uh, for the member and her constituents and others who are being affected by this issue, there are some very basic things that you can do to keep your family safe, things like making sure that your pets are secure, making sure that your garbage is secure, making sure that your barbecue has been cleaned on a regular basis. Speaker, I would say as a Northern Ontario member, this is an issue that we have been dealing with in a broader way uh, for a great deal of time. I, I make reference, of course, to uh, to nuisance bears that have been become a very serious issue for people in northern Ontario over the last number of time. Similar issues that affect the bears wandering into Answer. organized municipalities also are affecting communities now in southern Ontario. And in the supplementary, I have a little bit more detail that I'd like to share with the House. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry for his response and advice on how to reduce the likelihood of running into a coyote. However, many municipalities are wondering what action they can take to reduce the interaction between coyotes and their residents. In fact, just last week, Burlington, Mississauga and Brampton have invited Coyote Watch Canada to give them advice on how to reduce these interactions following the tragic death of a local dog. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, could you please explain to this House what municipalities can do to reduce the change of human-coyote interactions? Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Speaker. And again, I'll thank the member uh, from Kingston and the Islands um, for her question. I would, uh, of note, Speaker, mention to the House that in July of 2013, our government changed the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Act. And what that did, Speaker, was to allow municipalities to pay hunters or trappers for the removal of coyotes without MNRF permission. Speaker, I've had a number of members of our own caucus talking to me about this. Uh, it's information that I want to make sure that people are aware of. Municipalities have the ability to pass bylaws that ensure homeowners properly secure their garbage and other wildlife attractants. They have uh, an ability to pass bylaws preventing the feeding of nuisance animals. This is completely within the control and the purview of the municipalities in the province of Ontario. I would ask them to ensure they're doing everything to protect people, to protect their pets, and to protect uh, their property. As I've said, we've had great experience on this issue in Northern Ontario for quite some time. There is municipalities' uh, control and Answer. ability to manage this particular situation, and I'd, I'd ask them to do so. Thank you. The Associate Minister of Finance on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, I was delighted this morning to see a very good friend whom I met in my first year of university at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus, and she's a teacher here with her class, Ms. Kareen Gail David. Thank you. <laughs> Minister of uh, Government and uh, Consumer uh, Services. Thank you, Speaker. I want to introduce uh, Dr. Ron Common, uh, President of Sioux College, and Peter Berlin Jerry, the Chair of Sioux College, who are in the uh, Members Gallery. They're joining us for College Lobby Day today. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the amendment to the motion for allocation of time on Bill 21, an act to safeguard health care integrity by enhancing the Voluntary Blood Donations Act 2014 and by amending certain statutes with respect to regulation of pharmacies and other matters concerning regulated health professionals. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, take your seats, please. On November 24th, Ms. Matthews moved uh, government notice of motion number nine, a motion to allocation of time on Bill 21. Mr. Clark then moved that the motion be amended by adding the following after the second paragraph, that the committee be authorized to hold public hearings in following locations, Hamilton, Guelph, Ottawa, Kitchener, London, Windsor, and Sudbury, and that the fourth bullet point in the third paragraph be amended by deleting the second. <coughs> That, that the, f the fourth bullet point in the third paragraph be amended by deleting the word second and substitute eighth, and that the fourth paragraph be amended by deleting Wednesday, December the 3rd, 2014, and substituting the first weekend, the work, work first weekday following the completion of public hearings, and that the fifth paragraph be amended by deleting Thursday, December 4th, 2014, and substituting the second weekly following the completion of public hearings, and that the sixth paragraph be amended by deleting Thursday, December 4th, 2014, and substituting that day, and that the seventh paragraph be amended by deleting no later than Monday, December 8th, 2014, and substituting the first sessional day following completion of clause by clause. All those in favour of the amendment, please rise one at a time and be recognized. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Yurek. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Pettipies. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantoff. Mr. Vantoff. Madame Jolinot. Madame Jolinot. Mr. Tavis. Mr. Tavis. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. <laughs> All those opposed uh, to the amendment will rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayer. Madame Mayer. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandal. Ms. Sandal. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Darmerla. Ms. Darmerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. McGarry. This is McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Nidu Harris. Ms. Nidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. The ayes being 37 and the nays being 50, I declare the amendment lost. Is the House ready for the vote on the main motion? Yes. 
Ms. Matthews has moved government notice motion number nine. Is it the pleasure of the House the motion carried? I heard a no. All those in favor, please say aye. aye. All those please, uh, opposed, please say nay. nay. In my opinion, the ayes have it. Calling the members, this will be a five minute bell. in favor of the motion will rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Nackney. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Mr. Souza. Mr. Souza. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Quinter. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. McMeekin. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Ms. Albanese. Ms. Albanese. Mr. Kraft. Mr. Kraft. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jasek. Ms. Jasek. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Domerla. Ms. Domerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Ms. McMahon. Ms. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Naidu Harris. Ms. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Ms. Verniel. Ms. Verniel. All those opposed. Please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Ms. McLeod. Ms. McLeod. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Yakabuski. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. Dunlop. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Madame Jolina. Madame Jolina. Mr. Tavin. Mr. Tavin. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Sattler. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Mantha. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. The ayes are 50, the nays are 37. The ayes being 50 and the nays being 37, I declare the motion carried. There are no further votes, deferred votes. Therefore, this House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.